Display right now. Yeah. I've relied on the podium computer because I can't get my laptop to ever work on here, and now this is failing us. <laughs> so they're sending someone over, <coughs> probably like the flip of a button or something. But um, while we're waiting, let's talk about heat. So we've um, up to this point, we've talked about momentum transfer and mass transfer. And today's lecture is, is dedicated towards the introduction of heat transfer. If I've got a hot plate, oh, I'm going to go ahead and put that on. If I've got a hot plate and I stick my hand on the hot plate, eventually I'm going to feel that, right? So let's talk about what happens in order for me to have a signal transmitted from my nerves and my hand up to my brain. Uh, what happens previously? We've got a, a heating coil or some kind of heating element in the hot plate. And then what happens? Is heat transferring from my hand into the hot plate? No. Right? We've got a high temperature in the hot plate. We've got a cooler temperature in my hand. And just like mass transfer occurs ac across a concentration gradient from high to low, we're going from high temperature to low temperature. So the transfer isn't from my hand into the, the hot plate. Instead, I'm holding my hand here, and we've got several layers of insulation between my nerves and that heating element. And maybe there's some kind of ceramic top on there. So we've got that. And then we've got a dermal layer of, of you know, so many... Uh, Know, microns thick of skin that's, that's in between the edge of the, the ceramic layer and my nerve endings. Okay, and each one of those layers is going to have a certain uh, conductivity associated with it. And if I, if I hold my hand above the hot plate, then we've got air as a third layer. So we've got ceramic over the heating element, we've got air and then we've got that tissue layer previously, you know, prior to it reaching the nerve ending. Okay, so we can think about this as a composite of multiple layers of conductivity. And when we've thought about mass transfer, we've thought about this in terms of just a simple volume of interest in which something's diffusing across in a time-dependent fashion. But we've also started to think about this in terms of these effective resistances. And so that, that problem set problem where we're, the nitric oxide is, is going across multiple layers into the interior of the cell, we started thinking about this in terms of uh, really the, the combination of the thickness of those layers, the diffusivity within those layers, as well as in this specific example, it was also the partition coefficients that play a role uh, to define those, uh, those um, the material transfer across those layers. So now when we think about heat, we're going to be doing the same thing. And so to, in today's lecture, if we ever get a projector up, what we're going to first do is talk about steady state conduction. And we're going to look at an analogous form of the fixed first law, which will be defined for heat. And this will be Fourier's law of heat transfer. And we'll be talking about heat flux instead of mass flux. And instead of concentration gradients, we've got temperature gradients. And then we're going to ha have to define something to relate this time and length scale dependence of the material itself. So uh, when we're talking about 
our mass transfer, we had a diffusion coefficient. And we had different diffusion coefficients based on if it was you know, gas, liquid, or even solid in some cases. Um, and so now we're going to be talking about conductivity, heat conductivity. And that's going to, again, be a property of the material of interest. And heat is uh, a little more pervasive in the sense that it can penetrate and that energy transfer can occur across practically you know, any material, whereas we were somewhat limited with the diffusion in terms of what could actually pass across the material into primarily fluid environments. Okay, so um, what we're going to do when the slides come up is we're going to first derive the uh, from first law of thermodynamics. I know you guys don't take thermo, uh, more or less, uh, but we can come up with the conserva conservation principles of energy and how energy is conserved into kinetic en energy, potential energy, and thermal energy. And that conservation is going to be dependent on what's coming into the system if you inject energy into the system. Any work done by the system, which we would be dissipating energy. And then we also have to think about Reynolds' theorem in terms of what's coming across that surface area, what's leaving the other side of that surface area normal to the control volume. And so we're really going to be thinking about our conservation principles. Remember, we had that system variable B that we used for mass and momentum, and we substituted those in to Reynolds' theorem. And it kind of seemed a little silly to use some generic system variable B because we were just talking about two conservations, so why not just say them what they are? Well, now we've got a third conservation, and instead of uh, our uh, B of interest being mass or momentum, now we're going to be thinking about this in terms of energy. And so our system variable changes, our conservation relationship changes, and so therefore we'll be able to describe a time and length dependent equation for energy transfer. All right, so I guess while we're waiting, because who knows how long these people are gonna take to get here. Okay, so let's go back to our control volume of interest. And of course, Reynolds' theorem says that we have to consider what's coming in. We have to consider what's coming out. We have to consider what's happening inside accumulation or uh, uh, consumption. And that together is going to be describing our, our conservation of interest. So when we were talking about our in and out, remember we had our our integral across a control surface of interest. And we had some um, uh, the V dot, uh, V dot, <coughs> this was with respect to our, our control Let's see. X. I'm botching this up. Does anyone have their, their notes on them? B dot N. N. Thank you. N D A of interest here. And we're going to also have a conservation term in terms of our control volume. CV. In which we're looking at some D by DT of interest. And in this case, we're looking at, remember when it was mass transfer, we were looking at a rho, um, either a change in, our uh, 
density or we were looking at a change in our control volume of interest. Right. And now instead we're going to be thinking about this in terms of our energy. So we really need to think about this in terms of our, I believe this is along the lines of, of what we're, t we're talking about here. So we've got an energy term in our two integrals for control volume and control surface here for our transport. What we really need to think about is our energy in minus our energy out is going to equal uh, some time dependent change in our system energy of interest. So this would be some of T. So the first law of thermodynamics is really going to, you can cut this up in different ways. You can think about it in terms of in, out, and energy, or you can break it up in terms of what's changing across the control surface versus what's happening within the volume itself. So this is really a shame because I had this broken up on the slides in a more digestible fashion. Yeah, so um, I can't, the PC is on, mm -hmm. but I can't get it to give a signal onto the monitor or to the projector. Mm -hmm. I see this light here is supposed to be green, so I'm going to go back here and see if okay. I can fix that. Okay. Can I just raise this so I can continue? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics, let's, let's just start over here, is going to be, now we can't see this, dE dt equals dQ dt minus d work. DW dt equals Q dot minus W dot. So it's saying that the change in energy in your system as a function of time is due to your heat, your, basically your change in heat, versus your change in work. So these are rates. And this is denoted as Q dot and W dot here. Okay, so if we want to apply the Reynolds transport theorem to this in terms of energy, what we need to consider is that we have multiple sources for each one of these things. And specifically, we've got different ways in which we can think about, this would, could be considered addition of heat to the system. And this work rate, can be thought about in terms of what's happening inside this box here. Is the, is the fluid of interest or the material of interest doing work on its surroundings? So this work can be broken up into several components. So we can think of uh, pressure work, which is a control surface P times RV dot N DA. Yes. 
Thank you. So that would be if, for example, you're heating up something and, you're incre and it's a fixed volume, so you're really increasing the pressure in the system, then that pressure is going to be applying work onto the system. You can think about this as what's known as shaft work. And this is usually denoted just as W sub S. And the shaft work would be if you have some kind of mechanical energy that's applied on the system based on something happening inside. So, for example, if there's some uh, lever or actuator that is, that is pushed because of the fluid, that would be an example of, of shaft work. Um, we have what's known as viscous work. So you guys are kind of more familiar about viscosity and how that can be acting on its surroundings. So if you have some rough surface, then the environment inside can be applying work on the system based on that friction that's formed. Okay, so we can decompose the work term and this change in work rate into these different properties here. And likewise, we can change uh, this energy term. So if we want to think about this, sure. I was actually going to let OIT know this has been like this for several. OK, yeah. Probably not discussed over the time. Right, right. It's still not. I think, I mean, if it's not showing up there, then. Okay. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> well, um, do you, do you want me to put it back up or put it back down or um, I mean, yeah, my, oh, yeah. I'm kind of concerned that it's still not showing up on the podium. I'm going to have to go back down there. Okay. I'll, yeah, I've got a work around here at least. Okay, so, so we, can, we can take this dq dt minus dw dt, and if we want to think that, about that as a change in our energy as a function of time, We can manipulate the terms around. So, so let's start with first just thinking about this in terms of dq dt minus dw dt equaling, and now we've got sort of a rate of energy out of cd minus a rate of energy into CV plus the rate of accumulation of energy in the CV. Okay, so we can rewrite this as d dt e rho d volume, where this is the CV, plus that control surface integral e rho b dot n ds. Okay, so this is Reynolds transport theorem written for the variable B being energy. Okay, if we're substituting in these definitions of, of pressure, work, 
shaft work and viscous work, then we can rewrite this as Q dot minus our shaft work rate equals D dt CV E rho vol D vol plus, and then inside the surface integral expression, we're going to have a rho E plus P over rho V dot N DS plus our vis viscosity work. Okay, so we've broken up our change in dw dt into something that is on the left-hand side of the equation, something that's on the right-hand side of the equation, and something that's actually within this control surface equation. So we're saying that pressure is going to be acting on the surface, uh, because it, it, it usually is applied normal, or the, where it's in, of interest is applied normal to the control volume. Yes? Uh, is that P over L? Right That's P over rho. rho? Okay. Yes, so this is pressure. This is density. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now if we want to break down, so we had a breakdown of our work terms, and we can have a breakdown of our energy term. Our energy can be considered to be kinetic, heat, or potential. And of course, potential is really gravity. Okay. So if we're, we're keep considering each one of those, then we're going to rewrite this as our Q dot minus WS dot equals d by dt, our cv, e rho d vol, plus our cs, um, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong equation here. In our control volume here, we've got a u plus gz plus one half V squared rho d vol plus cs rho h plus gz plus one half v squared v dot n ds plus our viscosity term. Okay. So what we're actually doing is for our kinetic energy per unit mass, we're saying that this is one half V squared. This is going to be per unit mass of the fluid. Our heat term, where our thermal, thermal, thermal energy is considered to be H equals U plus P over rho um, is the definition of enthalpy, which is thermodynamic potential in your system. Okay, so it takes into account both the thermal heat U as well as a sort of a potential term in terms of our pressure and our density. And then our gravitational term is just going to be GZ. And so we're, we're introducing these into our energy here, and this is broken up in terms of U and H over here. So this is also energy. Okay, so this is considered to be the control volume formulation of the first law of thermodynamics. So we started with something very simple where we said a change in our um, energy in our system is going to be based on a change in heat and a change in work. And then we looked at that in terms of what's coming in and out of the system and what's accumulating or dissipating in the system to assign, in the case of work, which side of the equation it's on, and then whether it's acting on the system within the control volume or across the surface area. 
And so this is a very long, complicated equation. Uh, we're actually going to be looking at a time-dependent temperature change in a much simpler form than this. But I, what I had planned on is the first half of the, the class, at least exposing you to this so that you understand we've got these conservation relationships for energy just like we had for uh, mass and momentum. And they can be derived the same way using that transport theorem and a new system variable of interest. Okay. So let's go back to this example of me sticking my hand on the hot plate. So we said that that could, that could happen through a, basically a thermal diffusivity across all those layers. We had our ceramic layer, we had the air layer, and you know, my, my tissue layer. I mean, and each one of those is going to have a different thermal diffusivity coefficient associated with that. We call that a conductance. And intuitively, you, you have some understanding of conductance. You know things that are good insulators against heat. Um, so when you're wearing an oven mitt, you're wearing something that's a great insulator, preventing that conductance from taking place. And then you have other things that are excellent conductors. Uh, you know, a metal spoon, if you're stirring a hot liquid with a metal spoon, you know that that metal is an excellent conductor of heat. So it's going to diffuse across that metal layer to your hand quicker. Um, and so it turns out that if you think about conductance, just like we've thought about diffusivity up to this point, um, then it's very easy to apply analogous equations to these because they're really, what we're talking about is molecular interactions. And we're using the same properties of Brownian motion, except now when we think about these molecules colliding within a material or a fluid, we're talking about the thermal energy that's being dissipated um, by the, that collision interaction. Because right, the Brownian motion really is dependent on temperature, right? And, and it's really that thermal energy at the molecular level that's dictating that molecular motion. So whereas before we were interested in how those molecules are moving, now we're looking at how that energy is being transferred by those molecules. Okay. So I'm going to erase this if that's okay. Okay. Okay, I don't teach in here till Monday, so as long as it's fixed for me yeah, by Monday. I mean. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> can I erase everything so we can, or maybe I should just move this up and do that? Okay, so let's talk about what's happening if we've got some kind of partition. We've got a box. And we've got some partition across this box. And we've got um, a T1 here and a T2 here. And we're going to be interested in the heat flux that can occur across this, this, this layer right here. Um, so what we're going to be interested in doing is thinking about, um, we, and we can actually think about if this is a box that actually has fluid that's maintaining this at a steady state value. And these are well stirred, so they're uniform. We can all consider all those things. What we're interested in is if this is a box, so we actually have to think about this. Then what we're interested in then is basically this area that's, that, that heat transfer can take place. Right? So we're going to be interested in the, um, the thickness of this that's insulating the two layers. And we're also going to need to think about this area, that, uh, the surface area at which things can cross. And both of those things together are going to allow us to think about this heat conduction. So if we start with an equation where we're considering T2 minus T1 over L, we're 
we're going to consider our variables. Q is our heat flow in watts. Our area is going to be some surface area in length squared. Our temperature is going to be defined in Kelvin. And then our K is going to be our thermal con conductivity, which is like our diffusion co coefficient. So this K is going to depend on density, temperature. These are things that you would have lookup tables for in your appendix. Uh, you have different conductivity tables for wood, metal, air, all of these things. Okay, it's always important to realize that this area is going to be normal to the direction of heat transfer. Okay, so the ability for the heat flux to occur, and this is then going to be in watts per centimeter squared, and of course, in order for the units to work out here, our K has to be in watts per meter Kelvin, or centimeter Kelvin, I guess, if we're consistent with what we've used here. Then, then you're going to see that the ability for this heat flux to, to happen across the surface area is going to be inversely proportional to the thickness of the layer, L. And that makes sense. If I had a larger barrier, you're going to have less heat across a, that barrier. Okay? And by defining this in terms of watts per centimeter squared, we're creating a situation where we have something analogous to our N sub A, which was our moles per centimeter squared second. Okay, so the form of this is starting to look a little bit like Fick's first law. And in fact, if you look at it carefully, you'll, say, you'll see that it looks really like that um, Fick's first law of membrane uh, permeability because there we had sort of a, a, uh, just a delta C uh, versus our length of interest there. So with that in mind, let's take this a little bit further. So we started with a K times a T2 minus T1 over L. And we can rewrite that as a K delta T over L. And if we think about... Our, uh, our limits approaching zero, we can rewrite this as a minus k dt dx, where this minus sign here is reflecting that we're going from hot to cold. Just like Fick's first law had a minus sign in front of the d to reflect the high to low concentration gradient. And if we want to be totally proper and do this in three dimensions, we can say that it's equal to a minus k gradient of t. And that way it's applicable for any shape in any dimension in multiple dimensions if we need it. Okay, so this is known as Fourier's law. of heat conduction, and it's so simple, right, but it allows you to do different things because we can think about if we've now got multiple layers, let's start just with a single layer, and we're going from some high T1 to some low T2, just like with our slab 1D diffusion, we're going to have a linear slope representing that temperature profile inside that slab. And if we want to think about this, um, this heat flux, we can start with our, our Q over A equaling our minus K dt dx. 
I'm sorry, that's a two. And then we can integrate this from x1 to x2. So we've got our qa dx equals r minus k. And pulling that out, So I've moved the dx over to this side, and I've integrated across bounds where we have information on either side. And so this is a finite integral instead of an indefinite integral, so we, weren't get, we won't have any integration constants associated with this. We just have to evaluate this at each point. So we've got a q, and this is technically a qx, qx over a, pull that out of the integral, then we just have a um, x2 minus x1, and we've got a t2 minus t1, which, because of this minus sign, we can flip that around, so that becomes a t1 minus t2. We can take the k and pull it over to the other side. Okay. And then we can take this whole thing, if we want, and put it underneath. And the reason I wrote it that way is then you can see that we've got a t1 minus t2 over this expression here, which is our x2 minus x1 over k, which is equal to our t1 minus t2 over some resistance, R. Okay, so we started with a definition of just heat flux and physically what that represents. And we said we could set this up in such a way that we have something analogous to Fick's first law of diffusion. And so now, moving forward, we went from uh, like a, an approximate form here into an, a, a differential form. And then we use that differential form to apply known things about what's happening at x1 and x2 in terms of our t1 and t2. And then it's just a matter of integrating this, just as you would, might integrate Fick's first law, to get a relationship. And so again, you almost always want this q over a to be together to represent that heat flux. Q by itself, this heat rate, this heat flow in watts, isn't all that useful unless you, you have some surface area of interest that, that you're relating it to. So we almost always consider this to be a single entity, the way we thought about our, our uh, mass flux as N sub A. Okay, so then we see that we've really got a delta T over R here where R is our resistance defined in terms of the thermal conductivity and the thickness of the slab. Okay. So the real masters in lecturing on chalkboards and whiteboards plan ahead how they're going to stage things so that they always have like the relevant material, you know, like not erased as they're moving their boards back and forth, at least the old school days when I sat through a lecture with chalkboards, but I'm going to have to erase a little bit here. Okay, so we'll keep this as our Q over A here. Okay, so now if we think about uh, composite slabs, then we can think about two things of interest here, where we've got our X1, our X2, and our X3. And now we've got some profile in which we have different slopes associated with this based on their different conductivity. We've got some high value here and some low value here. Okay, the beauty of this is that if we have some steady state heat flux occurring, the heat flux from here to here has to equal the heat flux across the whole thing has to equal the heat flux here to here. Those fluxes are, are defined in terms of our Q over A, so they have to be upheld everywhere in our system. 
And so this is really useful because we can think about this in terms of some, um, some uh, first layer versus second layer in which our Q over A equals our minus K1, if this is, has a K1 and this has a K2 associated with it. And we've got our T1 minus T2 over X2 minus X1. And we can think about this also in terms of our K2, T2 minus T3 over our X3 minus X2. And those have to be equal to one another. So if we want to look at the overall QA of the system, we can think about this as a delta T over the sum of our resistances. Okay, just like we thought about this for our, um, our hindered um, permeability, if you will, uh, when we talked about membrane transfer. And we can define this then as our total length, T over 1 minus T3, over, and then we've got our X2 minus X1 over K1 plus our X3 minus X2 over K2. Okay. So in uh, office hours yesterday, Morgan asked a great question, which was with that nitric oxide problem on problem set eight, we calculated that the membrane contribution to the mass flux, or the, the membra membrane contribution to the, the molecular motion was very small compared to the overall dissipation of the molecule of interest. And she said, okay, I can calculate this, but I should be able to do this by inspection on these, these plots here, and how does this plot kind of help me with that? So, you know, here is some, some, maybe an easier way to see this, such that if you've got your heat flux going across here, you're essentially getting two slopes assigned to this. So you can look at the, the hindrance to that mobility, or in this case, the thermal energy transfer, in terms of whether it easily crosses a barrier or whether it has a hard time crossing a barrier. And that contribution is basically coming up in the denominator here. So if you're adding, you're summing up these resistances, you're looking at you know, how much numerically one is contributing versus another, okay? So, so far you're, you're starting to see these analogies. What I want to do now is talk about another mode of heat transfer. So with mass transfer, we've got convection. And in heat transfer, we've got convection too. So many of you have convective microwave ovens or convective ovens, and you turn it on and so the fan starts whirling. And all that's doing is it's saying instead of just letting thermal diffusivity from the heating coils, you know, emanate and fill up your oven space, you're turning on a fan and you're mixing it up so that, that fluid flow is facilitating the heat transfer. And so just like we had a diffusion analogous to conduction, here they're called the same thing, convection. So convection in this case, if we think about going back to that flat surface, and this velocity profile where we have some V equals zero and some V equals infinity, we can think about a temperature profile just like we thought about a concentration profile. So this is a little bit confusing to think about because we're talking about a high temperature here, this T at the wall versus some T infinity, when we show parabolic profiles like this, we're actually going from high to low so that we're really defining this in terms of um, T wall minus T um, and some T infinity. Um, let's think about this. Talking about this t, 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 t 
to all the basically what I should rewrite this. I don't think it's quite right right in the diagram. Remember with our concentration, we talked about unrealized concentration gain, and we went from zero to one here. We're doing the same thing here. So we've got our high temperature T wall, our low temperature T infinity, and this parabolic profile is re really representing some T wall minus T over T wall minus infinity, so that you're going from some uh, insignificant value up to your maximum value at T infinity. So it's a little bit confusing for us to show these parabolic profiles this way because it's really you're at your highest temperature at the surface. And then you're sweeping it away with that fluid motion that's occurring to facilitating the heat transfer. Okay, so just like with mass transfer, we had some N sub A equals R K delta C. And this was some KF. Now we're going to have heat transfer, so we're going to have some Q over A H times delta to T. Okay, where our delta T equals T wall minus T infinity. Okay? So if we want to then assign units to this, remember just like this KF had to have units to balance out with our moles per centimeter squared second, now our units here have to balance out so we got watts per centimeter squared. So our, our coefficient then is going to be H, is going to be in units of watts per meter squared Kelvin, such that when you multiply by your, your delta T, it's going to work out. Your Kelvin units will cancel out. Okay? So our K for our conductivity was in watts per meter Kelvin. Now our H is in watts per meter squared Kelvin. Okay. So that really covers uh, convection right there. Um, last thing. Heat transfer has one special extra mode. So with mass transfer, we stopped with uh, diffusion and convection. Heat has a third one, radiation. So that's something that doesn't really need particle uh, propagation in order to occur. So it's special and unique to, to thermal uh, transport. And that's how you know the sun is able to uh, basically heat us up down on Earth, even though it's traveling through a vacuum, right? in outer space. So uh, when you think about radiation, you can think about this in terms of, um, let's say I'm a sidewalk, and I'm getting zapped with um, this uh, uh, array of uh, basically uh, uh, radiative waves over the course of the day. I'm heating up, and then at night, even though the sun isn't round, you know, basically, I radiate heat off of that surface. So it doesn't rely on that thermal motion alone. It's also got some, some collection of basically uh, infrared uh, waves, which it's, it's dissipating into the environment around it. So there's a special Stefan Boltzmann law associated with tr the Q over A for our radiation-based heat transfer. It's a special formula. I want you to know that it's, it exists, and it's a different way of describing Q over A for that particular mode of tra transfer. But what you'll really be responsible for is applying convection and conduction with heat transfer the way we have been so far with mass transfer. Okay, so more or less, I didn't get through an example I wanted to show um, that, that follows a little more about uh, complex geometry. But more or less, we got to cover through what the lecture notes had. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, but you can see that thermal transfer isn't that bad, right? You got through the hurdles with mass transfer, and now this stuff is like cake because it's totally analogous. Anytime you want a, a temperature profile, you can apply the same 
problem-solving process that you use for concentration profiles. So on Friday's flip session, we'll go through a heat transfer example based on conduction. And then in, in next Monday's class, we'll move to uh, basically thinking about this in terms of um, the equivalent of our ma master mass transfer equation. We'll be using heat transfer equations to look at time and spatial dependence for temperatures. <laughs>